guess what? We've got a new lens to look at. Hey, welcome to another video. In this one, I'd like to talk about the Seven Artisans 24 millimeter F.14 APS-C lens. It has several mounts. The one I'm using it with is a Nikon Z mount because I'm a Nikon guy. It's this little lens right here. So first of all, I'd like to thank Seven Artisans, their distributor for reaching out and allowing me to take a look at this lens. As you might know, anytime that I've ever talked about a lens or a camera body or a piece of equipment, any kind of gear in the past, it's always been something that I have purchased with my own money and I had owned and used for a little while. This is the first time that a company has reached out to me and asked me to take a look at one of their products. I wanted to tell you that so that you knew I was sent this lens. I did not buy this lens. It's not going to change what I say about the lens, at least I hope not in my mind, but I did want you to know up front that I did not purchase this lens, they sent it to me. So I thank them for that. The other thing I'm not going to do, and again, I'm not being hypocritical, I've said this before in previous videos, I'm not going to tell you how you should or should not spend your money. So in the end, I'm not going to tell you whether I think you should buy this lens or you shouldn't buy this lens. What I'm going to do is share my experiences with you and what I could use the lens for, maybe what I couldn't use the lens for, and share my experiences. I'm going to show you some samples here in a minute or two and let you decide whether you think this is a lens for you or not. And one of the reasons why I'm going to do that is because I don't know your budget. I don't know really what you want a lens to do for you or what you don't want a lens to do for you. You're your own photographer. So I can't step in your shoes and say, oh yes, this lens is going to be good for you. Or no, this lens is not going to be good for you. It's not fair to you. And maybe it's not even fair to seven artisans. So don't expect me at the end to tell you whether you should buy the lens or not. I'm just telling you that up front so that you don't go through the whole video and say, oh, he never gave us his verdict. I'm going to give you my verdict and what I tell you and how I approached the lens and what it could and couldn't do for me. You can take it from there whether you would come to the same verdict or not. That's all I'm saying. Okay, first impressions. It came in a nice box. It was well packaged. It came with a, a really nice pouch. Now, I don't know if this pouch comes with all the lenses or not, or whether they just sent it to me separate for the review, uh, because it was shipped separate outside the box. It was this, and it was bubble wrapped. They may all come that way. I don't know. I just know that this came outside of this box. But it's a very nice pouch. And the box, it was packaged well. The lens itself, again, it's 24 millimeter and it's an APS-C lens, which means for full frame, it's about a 36 millimeter equivalent. If you use this lens on a full frame, on a full frame body, it will work. But what you have to do is you have to change the settings in your camera so that it recognizes it as a, a cropped frame rather than a full frame. And yes, you do lose some of your resolution. I'm not the, the, the technical guy on this, but I think it's about half, a, half the resolution. On a, let's say on my Nikon Z7 II or Z8, instead of a 45 megapixel frame, I'm going to get 
about a 20, roughly 20, which is still plenty. But you can use it. I used it both ways. I used it as if I was shooting with a full frame lens. And what happens is you get vignetting so that you kind of get a circle inside of your image. If you change it to the dimensions of a crop sensor, which I imagine you probably can do on your camera, then you'll see it without the vignetting. So it's easily done with settings. So yes, you can use it on a full frame camera. It's best to change the settings. I also used it on a Z50, which was a crop sensor camera. And so when I look through the viewfinder, what you see is what you get. The lens itself, I admit, I was a little surprised when I took it out of the box at the construction of it. To me, it felt very well manufactured. It's an all metal lens other than the glass. It's 344 grams, which is essentially about 12 ounces. So it does have a little bit of weight to it, but it feels well manufactured. It doesn't feel plasticky. It doesn't feel like an inexpensive lens. It feels like it's well made. Now this lens retail price is $109. And right now with the link that they sent me anyway on, I think it went to Amazon or B and H, whatever it was, it was on sale for $89. So you're not going to spend relative to other lenses. You're not going to spend a lot of money for this lens. Other first impressions. The lens cap is a little shallow and it comes off fairly easy. I think if they added just a little bit more depth to the, to the lens cap, it would probably stay on a little better. I know when I first took it out of the box and then I was going to put it somewhere, so I, you know, it, it just came off a little too easy. So be aware of that. The aperture ring sits just above the focus ring. Okay. The aperture ring does not click in. You just rotate it and it's 1.4 to f16 it's very smooth it, it feels very nice when you when you do set your aperture however you can't you can't click it in and from what I'm told video people appreciate the fact that it doesn't click in but for someone who shoots stills mostly like me I would prefer if it if it clicked in but it's very smooth when you do want to set your aperture and the other thing is because the focus ring sits right behind it. Uh, there were a couple times where I would set my aperture, say at f2, and then I would, you know, be reaching around to focus in, and I'd hit the aperture because it wasn't clicking in. In the EVF, I could see it get lighter or darker because I had I had inadvertently hit the aperture ring. I didn't really like that. It does have all the markings if you want to do zone focusing and and things like that, which is very nice. Like I said, the manufacturing of it is seems to be very well done. The back cap same as most any other lens. It's it's a good cap. It does not have CPU contacts on the back. Be aware of that. And what that means is when you set your aperture, unless I'm missing something, it's not going to show up in your camera. Your ISO, your shutter speed, and everything like that will show up in your EXIF data because that's controlled by your camera body. But it's, it's not going to show what lens you are using or what aperture. You may or, that may or may not be a problem for you. I kind of like to know my aperture. So the way around it is you would have to maybe carry a little notebook or something and say shot number blank was shot at F28, F4, whatever it was, if that's important to you. 
might not be. To me, I kind of like to know. I don't think that would be a reason to buy or not buy the lens, but be aware of that. It doesn't, doesn't have CPU contacts. For example, my Voigtlander 50 millimeter, which size in comparison is pretty close. This is a 50 millimeter F2. When you look on the back, these little things here, here's your CPU contacts. And so this does communicate with my, with my camera bodies. And also it has a click aperture. So this is kind of what I'm used to. Keep in mind through all that, it's $109. This retail, the Voigtlander, I think was $899. So it's not necessarily fair to compare it. Oh, and of course, I, I, in case I didn't mention or you couldn't figure out, this is a manual focus lens, not autofocus. It's only manual focus. I bring up the Voigtlander because I'm going to make a couple of different comparisons. And I want you to understand before I do, I might be a little unfair to the Seven Artisans lens and trying to compare the two because this is not necessarily designed for the same market. You're not trying to necessarily reach the same audience. So I realize that and I keep it in mind. I'm only using it as an example to give you examples, you know, to, to show you the difference between this lens and maybe something like this lens. That's the only reason why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it to denigrate this lens because again, I don't think that this lens is designed necessarily to compete with a different class of lens. The first image I'm going to put on the screen is the first image I took with the Seven Artisans lens. And I did that because it was a low light situation, which I think is what, what this lens is designed to do is low light. I mean, it's an F 1.4 lens. That's straight out of camera. I did not try to sharpen it or change the colors or, or anything else. That was straight out of camera. That's what I got. So you can take a look at it. That's a sample. The next sample I want to show you is a sign that I shot down by the lake by my house at different apertures. And again, those are straight out of camera. I didn't try to sharpen them up or dehaze them or clarity or anything else. Those are straight out of camera at different apertures. 1.4, I think one was 2.8, the other one was maybe f8. And if you were to blow them up and put them at say 100%, which these are not, you would see that at f8, it sharpens up quite a bit. At f1.4, if you were to blow it up at 100%, you'll see that the lettering is a little soft, even in the middle, it's a little rounded. But by f8, it sharpens up. The next shot I want to show you is a sign out front, and I like using signs because uh, I think they tell a lot. I shot it at f2 only because I wanted to compare it to the Voigtlander at f2. Now, granted, this is a 36 millimeter equivalent, and the Voigtlander, which I'm going to show you in a minute, is a 50 millimeter equivalent. So it's different. I get that. And you should be aware of that. I'm not trying to hide that fact. What I want you to do, though, is look at the background and look at the bokeh. At f2 on the one lens, and then when I pop up the Voigtlander, look at the, the creamy background, the bokeh on the Voigtlander lens. And the other thing that I would recommend in any time you use a manual focus lens is to use focus peaking on your camera body. If you don't know what focus peaking is, at least that's what it's called on an icon, it will have little dancing ants inside your viewfinder and it will tell you what's in focus and what's not. And it's pretty critical, especially if you're going to use a, an f1.4 lens, to really be able to focus in on 
what you want in focus, to be able to see how much is in focus and how much is not. When you get out to F8, it's not quite as critical, but if you're using those wide open apertures, it's really important, in my opinion, to, to put on focus peaking. It'll help you a lot. But look at the two. Look at the difference between the, the bokeh in the one and the bokeh in the other. You can decide which one you like better. The next one, again, is to show you the sharpness between the two. The top one being the seven artisans and the bottom being the Voigtlander. Again, at F2, but I just want you to see the difference. Now I'm going to put up a couple of images that I took of just some flowers that were along the way in people's yards on the sidewalk. I didn't walk in their yards, but along the sidewalk. And they were both shot at F8 with the seven artisans lens. To me, it proves that you can get some nice images with the lens. You can. Also, I think in the look, it's not as bright of a lens as say the Voigtlander. It's a little bit darker when you, when you look at it. It also, people might prefer the Seven Artisans because it has, in my opinion, a little bit more of a cinematic look to it as opposed to the newer lenses that have more of a clinical look that make sure they're dead sharp. For example, that Voigtlander lens is, I'm sure, the sharpest lens that I own. It's an incredible lens. The Seven Artisans, as far as sharpness from the center out, really at F2 to F8 really doesn't necessarily compete with a Voigtlander lens, something like that. However, again, you're comparing a $100 lens to a $900 lens. And I don't know how fair that is, but I do want you to see the difference that you, you get what you pay for. That doesn't mean that you can't get good images with a $100 lens. You can. Look at the two flowers. So who's this lens designed for, in my opinion? Someone on a budget. Someone who needs a 35 equivalent lens that doesn't want to spend eight, $900 for a 35 millimeter lens. That is not quite as critical as maybe a professional photographer. You're just an amateur photographer, you're kicking around you want to take some snapshots, that's probably who this lens is designed for. You can get some nice images out of it, especially if you know how to post-process and clear up the texture and the clarity a little bit. Maybe alter your colors in post-processing, which a lot of times you're going to do on an expensive lens as well. But if you can do that, you can get some nice images out of this, out of this lens. Maybe you're someone who wants to try a manual focus lens, but again, you don't want to spend eight, nine hundred dollars to test one out. You spend a hundred dollars and you want to learn a manual focus before you jump into a higher end lens. From what I understand, it's better for video, especially with that little cinematic look to it. The one thing that I found that I think it's going to be good for, and I'm going to use it for this particular genre, is infrared because for me with infrared you want that kind of cinematic maybe a hair soft kind of look anyway and the other thing I found is that it doesn't have a hot spot which really surprised me a hot spot if you've never done infrared is in the center of the frame you'll get like a white spot because of the coating of the lens for whatever reason, at least so far, I haven't seen a hot spot on this lens. And if you watch my next video, will probably be an infrared video 
using the seven artisans lens because I think it's going to be a very good lens for infrared. But again, I'll do a little bit more testing on that. The bottom line is that each lens, in my opinion, is designed to do what it's supposed to do at a certain price point. So you have to decide in your own mind, does the seven artisans deliver that at that particular price point? That's up for you to decide. To decide. It's not up for me. All I can tell you is I was able to get a couple of nice images out of it. I had to really go to f5, 6, f8. You know, at f4, f2, it's a little soft in the middle. I will probably use it a great deal as a 35 millimeter equivalent on my Z50 crop sensor, which is already converted to infrared, that seven artisans is likely going to be my main go-to lens for infrared now. But again, I'll do one more video and, and then I'll show you the results and we'll go from there. So like and subscribe if you want to see it. Well, you don't have to like, but I hope you like. But you can subscribe if you haven't already subscribed and we'll go from there. So anyway, those are my thoughts. You can tell me your comments if you have a particular question about it. I don't think, I don't remember if I mentioned earlier or not, it doesn't mention about being weather sealed or dust sealed. So I wanted to throw that in there. But if you have any other questions, you know, you can go to their website and look for the actual specs, how many elements and that kind of thing. I'm not a guy who, who does charting and I just, I take photos and see what I see when it comes to a lens. So again, thank you to Seven Artisans for sending it to me. I tried to be as honest and upfront as I could be for you and for the lens manufacturer as well. Those are my honest thoughts on the lens. And you can decide whether it's worth your $109 or not. So until next time, I appreciate you watching. Thanks very much and take good care. Bye for now.